All right, so you guys know uh, Simon Sinek um, in his famous TED talk about why, right? So what's the, the why? And um, there's a book about that. And so when we think about that as far as a company, sometimes people say, well, the why is to make money. And he says, no, that's wrong. That's the output, right? So it's important to kind of think down inside ourselves, what's the why of a company? And so I went through this exercise of like, what's the why of John Crossman? Like, what is my why? Like, so why is it that I'm so passionate about shopping centers in the real estate world? Why is it that I'm so passionate about working with college students? Why is it that my wife and I give out full-size Hershey bars on Halloween, right? And we are that house. We're so cool, right? <laughs> so why? And so my why goes back to um, legacy uh, issues. And so here's the first slide. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about my dad. My dad was a pastor and civil rights leader. And so this is my dad from 1970 in the Sun Sentinel. If you can see here, he was named a bridge builder for his ability to get uh, communities to work together. Uh, over here, this picture, um, that's Congressman John Lewis. If you guys remember the other speakers at the I Have a Dream speech, when Dr. King the speech, uh, five of them and four of have passed. Dr. Lewis is the last one. If you saw the movie Selma, he's in that, in that movie. Uh, next to him is Julian Bond, who is the president of NAACP. And then right there is my pops. So that's pretty cool. So he was part of in that era. And then three years ago, um, uh, Governor, then Governor Scott named an actual bridge after my dad. So the symbolism of bridge building, which I think is pretty cool. So if you're in the Maitland area and you see the Reverend Kennedy Crossman Bridge, that's, that's my dad, you know, so to talk about. So we continue that spirit in our family as far as like, what can we do to connect people and build people together? So I just would like to give that context. I, uh, I brought this, got a little picture of that, picture of my dad, it's cool stuff. Anyway, so what's the next thing? So let's talk a little bit about uh, my book. I, you know, I do a lot of lectures for college students, and that started off years ago. I got asked to uh, give a lecture to some college students, and they, they, they called the lecture, If I Were 25, and advice for students. And uh, I, I, they asked me to do it, and I said yes. I said the only problem was I was 24. Um, so we had to change the name to If I Were 21. And I still lead that lecture. It's, so it's about advice, getting into real estate. So as I was moving along in my career and working with uh, students, I started thinking about, you know, I can talk about cap rates or finance or real estate, different concepts, but what is it that students really need to hear, right? Like th that maybe someone else isn't talking about. And so I sort of tried to thought about how can I move in the space of harder topics, maybe more practical topics, and, and, and what would that look like? In my research on all of that, trying to figure out where I wanted to go with it, I started getting research to what are critical ages in people's lives? And so I think it's sort of stereotypical to think like a big moment in somebody's life is when they're, when they're middle-aged. And I, this is gonna shock you, I'm 48, right? So I'm I am a middle-aged guy, that's who I am. And I think we could all agree that if I bought a sports car, that's cool, right? Or Harley, <laughs> we're all good with that? Well, the thing about it is middle-aged, you know, sometimes people have a midlife crisis and they do a little something like that. Um, but the age that I really started to zone in on, circle on more and more, was 30 to 34. That is an age I just became kind of intrigued with. And I'll tell you why. I think that when you come out of college and you're building your career and all of a sudden you're 30 and you're like, man, I don't know that I like my job. Like that's an age where you could, you could quit your job and, and, and start over. So like my dad was a, a, was a business guy. Civil rights moves started, he was in his early 30s, quit, went back to Emory and Candler School and that's what he did and then retired at that. Um, at 48, I'm done. Like I'm a real estate guy, I'm not gonna become something else, you know. We also think about if you're 30 and you're married and you're not happy in that marriage and you think, gosh, I want to maybe get divorced and then remarry, have kids with somebody else. That's sad, but that happens and you can get 30. At 48, I'm not doing that. Like, uh, this is it. I'm writing this one out at this point, right? So that 30, 34, that's sort of an interesting age and in, like what happens with achievers. So that's what I started to sort of push into. And so um, I ended up doing this speech. I'm always afraid I'm wearing the same outfit in the picture. I, not. Um, but I wrote this speech called the Top Five Career Killers and Top Five Career Builders. And that, I did that at the University of Florida. And uh, you can look this up. It has like 4,000 views, which is really kind of amazing for an hour-long college lecture. And so I know my teenage daughters love it when I refer to myself as a YouTuber. They're like, no, you're not. I'm like, I am a YouTuber. There I am. <laughs> so, um, so you can look up that lecture. So that lecture is, is what I turned into the book. And so the book really talking about what are these key things that make people successful? And, and thinking about the demographic I'm focusing on is achievers. And I'm not talking about uh, career killers, career builders, as far as like, oh, you're showing up late to work, or, you know, I don't know, get a good haircut or something. It's not that stuff. It's really more deeper things, okay? So that's sort of the setup. 
So anyway, so I want to open up, I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine named uh, James Raffinon. So years ago, uh, my wife and I were searching for a church, and we heard about this church that had um, this really cool young pastor that was really gifted, and so we went and we listened to that pastor, and I thought he was okay, it wasn't blown away by. But what I was blown away by is this guy, James Raffinon. And what blew me away was, is that after the regular worship service, they had an additional worship service for parents and kids together. And I was like, that is cool. I never heard of that. It was so cool. And he, and he led that. And when you went into this place and you go, you go to worship with the kids, they give you popcorn and you can throw the popcorn on the floor. I mean, how fun is that, right? And I'm always looking for more things to do with my daughters. They're, they're 14 and 16 now, but then they were, they were little girls and it was super fun. And then James was leading and James is like, oh my gosh, you know, he, it's like, I'm not kidding you. It was like Sesame Street Live every Sunday. I mean, first class, awesome. And then James, so talented, James would go to like, uh, Comic-Con, Megacon, do you guys know about those things? Yeah. Nerds. Um, anyway, so, so he would go to those things and he would interview like Jenny Cart McCarthy and uh, Jim Carrey and uh, Brian Matt, and he would interview them and I tell you, you can look these up, he's as funny as they are. I mean, on point, funny, hilarious guys. And then they would play these videos and it's awesome and, and there would be jokes that like the kids don't get, it's kind of for the parents, like they re refer to 80s music, which is the best music by the way. <laughs> and so it was really cool. So. Uh, so James and I are friends, and James is uh, in his early 30s. He's had really big success. Uh, but then, like a lot of people, he was starting to have some, some hard times. And so one of the hard times he was having was, was in his marriage. And his marriage was really having some issues, actually moved out of the house. And then he had started some issues with like, um, uh, his work. He was having some real problems at work. And so he and I were talking about that. And I, I remember, we, you know, he's one of the, you know those good people that you text like, like every, you're always kind of in a conversation, like always in a picture and things. So we're going back and forth, and I called him one time, and I said, listen, you need to get your arms on a couple things. One is you're, you're going to get divorced. And I'm like, it's okay. You know, it's hard, it's terrible, but we can get through this, and we can work on it. And I said, the second thing is you need to get your kids out of private school. And I said, I, I went to private school, I went to public school. My kids are in public school. You're in private school. You don't have a job. You know, we can kind of deal with that, right? So we're dealing with that. Let's see, I got the picture here. Oh, see, there's the reality. No, oh, isn't that a nice picture? We already got it. Uh, side note, I used to um, do a lot of MC work for charities and churches. And then I saw him uh, perform one time, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like the ranking amateur, and this guy is like a professional MC. Like, people need to be like using that guy. And so, by the way, when I turned 40, um, they did a party for me, and he was the MC, and he roasted me. It kind of hurt, I'm just going to tell you, but it was like hilariously funny. Anyway, so that is the Man in the Mirror prayer breakfast that I used to MC, and then he started MCing. So anyway, James had a job, and my nephew, Ken, who is one of my favorites in the family, don't tell anybody that, but he is, he's a recruiter. And so I contacted him, it's okay, hold that thought. Um, so I contacted him, I said, can you help me out with James? So he, met, he meets James, he's blown away, like I've always been blown about James, and he's like, I'm going to help James get a job, and he got him a job, and it was a salary job, paid $120,000 a year, big time job. So the first day on the job, James, or um, uh, Ken emails me, and he says, Uncle John, James didn't show up for work today. We found James' body the next day in downtown Orlando. And that same photo is of James, and that was used at his memorial service. <coughs> what happened to James? I, I led a suicide walk recently, and uh, his mom was there, and she gave me that. So I have that picture, and so I have that with me a lot of times. So how did we lose James? What is, he went suicide. What happened, what happens to me? I was his mentor. What kind of terrible mentor am I that somebody I'm leading blows their brains out? Whoa, what happened to James? Oh, I'm going to pause on that one. I want to let everyone repeat real quick. So let's think about it a little bit. What about, um, what about Kate Spade? Who is cooler than Kate Spade, right? I mean, seriously. I mean, you're a woman, and like, you make purses, and everyone in the world knows your name. And they, I mean, what's that? Anthony Bourdain, your job is to eat food and talk about it, right? Aaron Hernandez, have you watched the Netflix thing on Aaron Hernandez? Oh my gosh. Aaron Hernandez uh, went to the University of Florida. I went to Florida State. He played for the Patriots, like every good American. I'm a Miami Dolphins fan, okay? <laughs> when, he, when I heard, I was in a meeting, that's just truth, okay? I'm just telling the truth. I was in a meeting and the person next to me elbowed me and said, Aaron Hernandez, committed suicide in prison. 
And my response was almost tears. Like, I, I, in my gut, I just felt this enormous pain. Why did I feel so much pain? Because I've seen beauty happen in prison. I've seen redemption and reconciliation in prison. And I weep for that loss of life, right? So if we start talking about it, we're, we're all going to start talking about huge, incredibly talented people that we've lost to suicide. And how does that, how does that happen, OK? And, and the quick part I will tell you, uh, one of the main things I want you to hear from me is, when we see extremely talented people, often the talent comes from intense wounding that's never been dealt with, OK? I mean, we could name talented people, and I'm saying to you so many times, if we went to, we dug in their life, we'd find deep pain. And if the pain is not dealt with, it, it'll come to some tragic end. Sometimes when we look at young people, we think, oh gosh, you know, if, if it's the first time in life they fail, it's going to be terrible for them. And I'll give you an example. I, uh, for now, <laughs> 10 years, I'm real hard to believe this, I do the Military Academy Appointment Board for Senator Marco Rubio. So I have a Saturday that I interview 25 students that are trying to get in the Naval Academy or West Point or Air Force. And all these kids are ri ridiculous, can do 100 push-ups and never seen a bee in their life and all that kind of stuff. But when I get done interviewing all 25 of them, I only rank 10 and only about four get picked. So if you finish 11 through 25, your name's just deleted and shredded and gone, right? So when I meet these kids, the first thing I do is I pump them up about how exceptional, because they are exceptional, and I know that the largest percentage of them are going to have failure the first time. But I don't worry about that, because I think people naturally understand failure. What they don't naturally understand is you can have tremendous achievement and then have depression. I think there's people that win a Super Bowl ring, and a couple days later they feel like crap. Or they win a Tony, or they get a huge promotion, and they have a title, or big income, or, or whatever, and then they're like, wait a minute, this doesn't feel good, right? So it's actually the, the success that I think is more concerning than the failure. Okay, so with that, with that in mind, I want to jump to some, some builders. And what I want to talk about more in this lecture is like key things that we can sort of think about of how to make ourselves healthy. And um, one thing I want to point to before I get into the slide is uh, Creation Health. Um, uh, you guys know Ad Advent Health, those guys? I love those guys. The only thing I don't like about them is they're against bacon, and that's just wrong. Okay, <laughs> Bacon wrapped anything is fantastic. They need to learn that. But seriously, like, so they have a book, and it's called Creation Health. And um, I just like this little thing to remind me about it, and I've got some bookmarks if you want to take them. But the thing about that book is, is that part of their mission is to help the average person in Central Florida live 5% longer. That's a pretty cool why, right? And their whole vision is we should live to be a healthy 100. You know, we used to think, you know, you get up, and you're 25-year-olds, that's your peak health, and then you just like, boom, and you're dead at 65. And so what they're coming out saying, well, no, like you should come up 25 peak health, and you should maintain it till you're 99, and then boom, that's it. And we should be we should be actively doing things this whole this whole time. And of course, we see that more and more people doing stuff no longer. So let me ask you this: if if I want everyone in this room to be a healthy 100, what are the things that we need to do to make sure we live to be a healthy, active 100 years old? I'm going to take a sip of water while you guys answer that. So what? what give me an example. Exercise. Exercise. Okay, good. Eat healthy. Cut out stress. Well, some we can, some we can't. Positive. Can we talk about um, diet for a second? What the heck is kale? I mean, where did that come from? I mean, what? I don't remember that terrible vegetable as a child, and now it's, are we just inventing them? It's just, uh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. No, my wife had to have a procedure the day, and the doctor said she can't have any vegetables for the rest of the day. And I was like, I've been living that diet my whole life. I'm the way to go on that. So we know that we need to exercise, right? And we know we need to eat right and quit smoking, less sugar, less salt, all that kind of stuff. But what's something else that we know we need to do to live to be a healthy 100? Exactly. We have to be in relationship, right? That's how God created us. That's how we are. There's no denying that, that our humanity, we need each other. If, 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 one of, if any of us moved to Montana and moved to the top of a mountain and we did yoga every day and ate all the kale in the world, um, but we had no relationships, and then somebody else in Orlando was a little overweight and you know, didn't always actually, then ate you know, some uh, apple pie and good stuff like that. But they have strong relationships. They'll outlive the person in Montana. Now, don't hear me saying I'm anti-yoga. I am anti-kale. But <laughs> that's just part of our human condition, right? So understanding that is really key. So with, with that as a setup, 
I want to walk to talk you through the, like just a series of things about relationships I just want you guys to think about. And the first one I want to talk about is mentors, okay? That's George Livingston. He was a longtime mentor of mine. He passed away a couple years ago. Great, great man. And I love that picture of him laughing. It always makes me smile when I, when I think about him. But he was a mentor of mine. So when we talk to young people and we talk to them about uh, the importance of mentorship, the concept sounds simple and easy, right? We, we all want mentors, people help us. I want to put that on the side for a second. And I want to talk about something different. Let's talk about charity. What's charity? Right? Giving. You're giving out. What do you get back? Joy. Cash? No, do you get, do you get cash back? You get a watch? No, so, so charity is giving with expecting nothing in return, right? Okay, that's one way we define charity. I think another way we define charity is uh, crisis, right? So if a woman is being beat by her husband, she grabs her kids and she jumps in the car and she drives off and she's got no purse, she's got no wallet, no money, she is in crisis. She needs help, right? Or when the hurricanes hit Puerto Rico and like they were in crisis, right? So we, we didn't send bottles of water and food out of Puerto Rico and want something back. They were in crisis, right? Um, charity tends to be short term, right? It's short, short term, it doesn't last forever, right? Like if that woman in that crisis situation, if she kept showing up your house every Friday, leaving her husband, you're like, hey, wait, 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 time out. There's something else that's going on here. Stop going back, you know, or whatever. We did we figured it out. So that's what charity is. Okay. There's that. So what is relationship? Well, relationship's something different, isn't it? Relationship is the healthy yin and the yang. It's giving and receiving. The art of a great conversation is how are you? Look at me. How are you? Look at me, right? And we go back and forth. Do you have any friends that if you never talk about yourself, they never ask? Yeah, well, and by the way, it could be, could be you. <laughs> by the way, it could be you. <laughs> I have a friend uh, named John Martinez, and John Martinez is my favorite guy of wisdom, and I, and I go to him for uh, husband advice and father advice and business advice, and like I talked to him on the way here advice, what do I do, you know? Um, and he's awesome, but sometimes I call him and I say, John, how are you? And I shut up because I, I want to make sure I stay in balance with him. I gave a lecture this week at uh, Florida State University, and it was to honor students who, I think this coming week, um, this one guy is going to fly them in a private jet down to his home, and they're going to spend the day with him, and blah, 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 and then they're gonna, he's going to fly him back. So one of my things was, is giving advice on how to behave on a private jet. <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious. Like, do you take pictures and post on it? No, 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 you don't, right? So, but I was talking about balance. like. What's the price of a ticket on a private jet? It's like $15,000. Like, so if you're taking that ticket, what are you giving back? And it better be respect and attention and this kind of thing. So, mentor. Do we want to have mentor relationships? Or do we want to have mentor charity cases? You see what I'm saying? So when a college student calls me a week before graduation, I need a job, I need a job. And they're in crisis, right? I'm going to help them. But I'm not going to help them like I would help somebody who's focused on a relationship. Do you know that if we, um, we talk to Tolson Institute or Desire Street Ministries with Danny Werfel and we talk about how do we help homeless people, you know, if we look at homeless people like we're here and they're here, that's really unhealthy for them. It's also really unhealthy for us. But when we look at all people having human dignity and, and worth, it's different, right? We can help them get out of that situation faster. It's also better for us. You guys know the movie Good Will Hunting? You know that movie? Oh, I love that movie. For those who don't know, there's a super jerk professor, not a PBA professor, I can tell you that right now, but a super jerk professor, and he's at this big fancy Ivy League school, and he does this super complicated math problem, and he doesn't put it in the classroom, he puts it on the wall in the hallways, and he's like, what student can solve this math problem? Because he's a jerk, and then we can solve it. And they come in one day, the math problem is solved. But it's not solved by a student at the fancy school, it's solved by the janitor. The janitor solves the problem, and you're like, oh my gosh. So the janitor is played by Matt Damon. He's a South Boston toughian, and he has this terrible relationship with his father. Remember one scene, he said, my dad used to give me a choice, a belt, a switch, or a wrench. And it's like, to beat him, and he goes, oh, you got to take the belt. He goes, no, I took the wrench, because F him. Sorry, but that's just making the point, right? And so they put him into counseling, and he's so smart, he destroys all the counselors until they get in with Robin Williams. Robin Williams is a counselor. They're working together, and they have the big breakthrough moment where Robin Williams says, what? Not your fault. Not your fault. And he hugs him. So years ago, I was at a church, and I was doing prayer ministry. And, and, you know, people walk up after church for prayer. It's bad, right? So this woman comes up. She was, like, in her fourth trimester pregnant, and she's like, uh, 
Did you catch that? Did you catch that? She, uh, she said, my brother, or my brother, my husband's having some trouble. I said, well, tell me about it. So anyway, I go and see her husband. Now, her husband's name is Blake. Blake is, like, you think the exact opposite of how I look. Like, he's a big, tall, big guy, big beard. I can't grow a beard. He's a big beard. He's a big guy, right? He's a big, strong guy, kind of quiet. And so um, Blake, to this day, will not take his shirt off when he goes swimming because his adoptive father beat him so bad, his sternum's all messed up, okay? Now, Blake's having some troubles, and so I was trying to help Drake learn some skill sets. So I said, you need to go to counseling. He goes to counselor, he can't afford big time counseling. He gets the lower level counselor. He destroys the counselor. They're gonna call the cops, they call me. And I go down there, and I said, I'm gonna pay the gap so he can have the senior counselor. He's seen the senior counselor. This is years ago, he's still seeing the senior counselor. Senior counselor calls me a few days later, he said, Blake should be a college president, he's a genius. He's Will. It's crazy. I'm this is a totally true story. So Blake and I, to this day, he loves um, the Marvel movies. You know those movies where you got to sit through the credits and the credits and the credits because there's more scenes. Like, what are we doing here? Like, I need to know the gaffer because i got to see the scene. When we go see these movies, Blake buys the tickets. And then I get there, and I was like, Blake, can I buy a hot dog? He says no. And then I buy him three. He's a big guy. <laughs> why, why is it that Blake wants to buy the tickets? Because he doesn't want to be a charity case. He wants to be my friend. He wants to be in a relationship. Because he cares about me, and I care about him. And when I allow him to buy tickets, I give him dignity. I give him humanity. Right? So if we go out in the world and we see some billionaire, and we think, oh my gosh, I want Warren Buffett to be my mentor, because he can give me so much stuff. That's not healthy, guys. But if we think, gosh, he could give me something, and I could give him something. right? And so when I talk to young people about this, they'll say, well, what can I give? A thank you note is very nice, right? There's lots of, figure it out. Like their company on Facebook, be a fan. I don't know, figure it out. I met with a billionaire one time, and I kid you not, he had his own private museum, which looked like, like a 15-year-old boy who had a billion dollars. I mean, there's so many cars, you can't, I'm, I'm telling you, like cars are cars are cars. And so when I got done, meeting with him tour, and I went to my car and I said, let me get, and I came back and I gave him my book, I gave him a signed copy of my book, and he freaked out, right? Because he's not used to people giving him stuff. My book's not worth that much, right, by the way, <laughs> right? So I just want you to get that framing. And so if somebody says to you, I want you to be my mentor, I, I would have some thought about that, right? Is it a charity case or is it something you want to have a relationship, okay? All right, let me move to the next concept. Uh, Step Brothers, that's my favorite movie, by the way. By the way, I have an actual stepbrother, and he is an Emmy Award winning editor in LA. And when this movie came out, we were the exact age of the characters and stuff like that. So no, it's just funny. So I, on his birthday, I'll say, you made him call me Nighthawk. You know, it's just we have a running thing. But anyway, so let me talk about it. So real quick, in life, I think we have three levels of relationships. We have acquaintances, we have friends, and we have brothers and sisters. So acquaintances are people that we just meet each other, like you see me tomorrow in public. So I go, hey, we saw just totally cool. Friends are people, we have lots of friends, and friends are cool. I think the word that defines friendship is encouragement, right? Um, so like the TV show Friends, they all kind of encourage each other, like our friends on Facebook, like, hey, happy birthday. That's good stuff. We all need that. We all need some hugs and things like that. Brothers and sisters are something totally different. These are people that practice exhortation. These are people that love you and you love them. And they're the kind of people that you say things like, you have broccoli in your teeth. <laughs> or your zipper is down. <laughs> or you are verbally abusive to your wife, and it's wrong. And you need to go to counseling, and I'll go with you. Okay? Years ago, I, I got, somebody told me that these two former employees of mine were having an affair. And I knew the woman more than I knew the guy, and so I reached out to her, and I said, what's going on? She blasted me back. She's like, how dare you? I said, listen, I don't want to be your friend. I want to be your brother. And I'll risk the whole relationship to push into this. Six months goes guy, and she, and she contacts me. She said, I come see you. I said, sure. She comes sees me, and she cries. And she said, I, I was having an affair with him. and destroyed my marriage, and we broke up. And we still work together, so we can see each other every day at work. Isn't that great? That's a good move. Uh, <laughs> he, um, he slashed your tires, you know, that kind of just craziness, right? But here's the deal, guys. From the time that I heard that till the time she told me the truth, in that six months, 30 people told me they were having an affair. You know why? People love talking about stuff. You think you're having an affair and it's a secret? It ain't. 
You smoke, you smoke weed in the park a lot during lunch? Yeah, everybody knows, right? I mean, like, I'm just telling you, you think people don't know? They know. Nobody told that young lady uh, about that. No one called her out but me. And I didn't consider us that close. I just, you know, I'm just kind of a jerk, I guess. But this is a very talented, young, beautiful, hardworking woman that was making a terrible mistake, and even the people around her weren't speaking into her. Now, I, when I say this, it's easy for all of us to say, um, you know, yeah, oh, yeah, no, I want, yeah, no, 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 I want people to tell me the truth. And then someone tells you the truth, oh, wow, ouch. And you got to learn to start telling, you got to learn to start saying thank you. When somebody tells you something really hard, I'm always, I'm always getting in a fight, but um, uh, I've, I've got a thing going on in my life right now where I'm getting a lot of hate mail. And it's in the civil rights arena. People are nuts. But I had a guy message me privately, and he said, you are insane. You know, I thought that was nice. So I, um, I took him to lunch, and I, and I sort of told him my reasons for what I'm doing. But here's the key, though. I looked at him, and I said, thank you for telling me that you think I'm insane. I appreciate it. Because if you said it, there's probably 300 people that are thinking it. And you said it. And while I don't think I'm insane, I appreciate it because it helps me you know, calc recalculate, wait a minute, how am, I, how am I saying this? Maybe I'm saying this too, too strong, maybe I'm saying it too light, right? I mean, I don't know, but I need to walk into that. So to have these real relationships, it is hard. I gotta work on it, okay? All right, let me go to my next one. Um, I wanna just, just stay here for a little bit, and this is on professional counseling. So my dad, being a pastor, he did counseling. So people would come to my house, my, our parents, my parents' house, and they'd get counseling from my dad, and I, I thought they were all losers. I mean, give me a break. I used to always be like, what is just get, just work harder? And of course, what possibly might, would my dad have to offer anyone, right? It's my dad, he doesn't know anything, right? Right? <laughs> We've all been there, right? So anyway, um, in 2004, I had a really interesting year. In 2004, um, uh, my dad went off dialysis, and so if you know what that means, he came home, spent some time with us, and then he went to a coma and he passed away. It's a big deal. Um, my youngest daughter, Ava, was, uh, was born, and they, she had an acute life-threatening event. She was two weeks old, and she almost died. I had a road in the back of an ambulance with her. Two weeks old, that's tough. Recently, somebody said to her, remember the time Ava almost died? And Ava was like, I almost died? I'm like, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> Shut up, <laughs> you know. During that same time, I injured my back, and um, you know the pain scale, the one to 10? Do you know what 10 is? I do. 10 is screaming uncontrollably. When you have to shove something in your mouth to stop because the screaming is that bad, I had a muscle around my spine that went to spasm, right on the nerve. Bad, bad, bad. Oh, and then our house got damaged in the hurricanes. This is all within this season, a season of life. And so I'm telling you, I would wake up angry. I would wake up, I would take a shower. I remember washing my hair being like, oh, I'm so angry, right? And so my wife said to me, she said, you need to go see a professional counselor, to which I was like, I don't think so. And she said, well, you need to because you're angry. And I'm like, well, I have a right to be angry. My dad's dead. My kid almost died. My back hurts. My house is all screwed up. I think I have a right. And then she was like, like no, seriously, you, you, need, you need to go. So I went. Now, here's the thing. I want you guys to hear me. Going through that season of counseling, of course it made me a better dad. Of course it made me a better husband. It made me a better business person significantly. There were some things going on in my, my job at the time that were legitimately bad. But I had this emotional stuff going on that was juicing it way up, right? So my points were right, but I was so angry it was coming on too strong, right? So the removal of that wounding in my personal life, I still addressed the issues, but I was calmer, right? I uh, was, had fantasized about quitting that job, and my fantasy was, I'm gonna drive over a bridge, throwing a match back in the Bridge catches fire, and I double middle fingers as I drive <laughs> away. I'm sorry, is that not that? I'm just saying that's what I thought, right? It's what I thought. You said be real. It's kind of fun to think about. Leaving church that way. So. Anyway, um, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I went to the counseling for a long time. All that happened around 2004, I didn't quit that job until 2006. And here's what happened. When I quit in 2006, they wrote a poem about me. I, I swear to you, and I have it framed, and I have it hanging in my, my office now. Um, 
when you leave brokerage companies, it's like Jerry Maguire where it's like super calling clients. They allow me to forward my voicemails and my emails for three weeks. That's, that's unheard of to have that done. That done. Um, it, it really reset everything in my life, okay? It's really powerful. 2013, uh, 2013, I was around 42. I had a lot of big things happen in that era. I got into the FSU College of Business Hall of Fame. I was named an honorary alum from the University of Florida. I don't know how that happened, but that happened. <laughs> so I had all this big stuff going on, and um, I was a runner in college. I was a sprinter, but as you get 40, you can't sprint anymore, and so I started doing distance running, and because I'm like a super competitive person, I was like winning the, my 5K age groups, which no one cares about, but I did, that was my thing. <laughs> And I ran a marathon, and then I, I really was doing this crazy stuff. So it was a Sunday morning. I had worked all day Saturday with Senator Rubio. And it was a Sunday morning. I ran a half marathon in my neighborhood, and I ran my best time ever. I crossed the finish line, and I was like, I don't feel right. I saw an ambulance, and I thought about going to the ambulance, and I thought, <laughs> I'm going to walk up the ambulance. But I was like, I don't know. I don't know what they are. Anyway, so the uh, next day I went to work, and I was in front. And the next day I went to work. I had one meeting, and I thought, man, I don't feel right. So I went to my doctor's office. And the nurse was asking me, and she's walking me back to the doctor's office, and the nurse looks at me and she goes, you're suffering from depression. And I was like, no way. Are you kidding me? I'm like the happiest guy you're ever going to meet, right? <laughs> Takes me back there, and I got diagnosed with clinical depression. And I got put on Zoloft and Klonopin for one year. Okay? Now here, I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. You should really hear this. When I started that, and I was on the, the beginning of the depression, and then the depression hit, I take that back pain over that depression. You hear what I'm saying? I would take that back pain. And if you've never had clinical depression, and you hear someone has clinical depression, and you hear they blow their brains out, you calm down before you judge that person. But you don't understand it. It's hell. You cannot feel joy. You cannot feel happiness. Now, I'm grateful for it because it gave me perspective. I'm grateful for it because I had to lie at Jesus' feet and I survived. Right, and the journaling I did, but I never want to go back. It's so bad, okay? Now, when I went through that, and I had a great psychiatrist and I had a great doctor and counselor, um, I, uh, I remember I was so scared to tell Christian friends of mine, because I thought I was a bad Christian, because I was on pills, that my faith couldn't get me through it. And of course, I went to one Christian guy, I said, hey, I don't want to tell you this, I'm so nervous. And I told him, and then you know what he said? Me too, me too, me too. And by the way, during that season, how helpful were pastors? They weren't. And that, don't think bad of pastors. They're not trained. We do this weird thing where it's like, you know, would we go to our pastor and say, I got this toothache right here? <laughs> no, we would not do that. They're not trained in teeth. They're not trained in chemical issues in our brain. They're not trained in trauma in our childhood. They're not trained in that. They're trained to preach God's word, which is part of what we need right? We need that, but, but they're not going to cut our grass for us, okay? There's other things in life. We need other people and other resources, okay? Um, you know something funny? During that season, I had to go to the doctor all the time because all the pills and everything, and I was seeing the doctor, and, we'd see, and he looked at me one day, and he goes, you know what? I think you're dyslexic, and I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, and I'm like, what do I do? And he's like, oh, you're 42. Just write it out, um, <laughs> you know? So I, uh, I no, this is true. And so I, then I took all these tests, and I'm actually like super duper dyslexic. And there's a college in uh, Leesburg called Beacon for people, college for people with dyslexia and learning abilities. And I've been a keynote speaker there to <laughs> students about <laughs> dyslexia. Go, go figure, right? So I learned something. So the next thing I want to tell you real quick is this. Uh, in 2015, I had a friend of mine, and he said to me, um, there is a Bible study I want you to do. It's the hardest Bible study you're ever going to do. Oh, that's it. Bring it on, baby. That's what I said, right? So the, the, it, I don't recommend the book, but the guidebook, Voice of the Heart, Voice of the Heart. I would keep that arrow in your quiver. The guidebook, the, the, the questions, and the videos, are it's the best I've ever had. Now, one of the first things we do in it, and I always forget this part, I can't remember the, what, if the question was something or sad, but I think it was sad. It was like, write the top 10 saddest things you've ever had happen to you, okay? I swear to you, I'm looking at the piece of paper and I'm like, I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything. You know, I'm blessed. I am blessed. I am blessed. I don't, nothing sad's ever happened to me. Hmm. So I called a counselor and I said, I, I don't think I understand what sad is. So I went and saw this counselor and so we started talking about that. Here's what I learned. My addiction, 
my addiction, okay, my addiction has been success. When you look at my LinkedIn profile, I'm one of those people that had terrible, terrible, traumatic, wounding childhood with all kinds of bad stuff that happened. And instead of dealing with it and processing it, what did I do? I got another promotion. I got another deal done. My, my resume is ridiculous. You look at it and you go, that is ridiculous. And I use that word, it's ridiculous. There's a level of it that's impressive and cool, but there's a lot of it that you're looking at a sick person, right? So when you look at my life now, after through all the counseling I've been, I don't have as many aspirations as I used to. I don't work like I used to. I'm not driving as hard because I'm healthier and more peaceful, right? How did we lose Michael Jackson and Prince? They died young. Do you know how we lost them? Because those guys were wounded and they were performing and they're making a ton of money and everyone around them didn't want them to get healthy because if they had gotten healthy, they'd stop singing. That happens with lawyers and pastors and stockbrokers and doctors that they don't ever get the health and because everyone's feeding off that, they don't dive in deep. If they get a healthy, maybe they won't be a good preacher anymore or singer or dancer or whatever, okay? And that was what was true for me. And I learned that through that season. Now, as a runner, I never wanted to ever throw up. As a public speaker, I didn't ever want to cry, right? It's like I'm always about controlling my body. So I went through this whole season of life out sad and I got a call one day and, and the guy in my Bible study, Mr. Davies, an older guy in his 80s, and they, they called me and said, hey, um, uh, Mr. Davies had a stroke and he's not gonna make it. So I said, oh my gosh, is he taking visitors? And they said, well, no, except you. He went to you. And I'm like, oh, geez. So I go to the hospital. You know, he's, got, he's in the bed with the little table thing across him. And I walk in and he's got an envelope with my name on it. This is some serious stuff, right? So he gives me the envelope and he's not totally there, but he said to me, he goes, um, I have this building. I haven't taken care of it. I'm gonna die. I want you to take care of the building for my kids. I said, okay. So, then he gets moved home with hospice. Now, two years earlier, his um, uh, wife had died. And when his wife died, he told me in the guys are Bible study that he had told her she could let go. And he said that, that sometimes you do that with older people. You let them know it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. And then she passed. So I go to his house and he's sitting there and then his kids are all there. And he's like super old and so his kids are like old too, right? Like, like crazy dynamic. But like, right? <laughs> so I'm sitting there and he, he's, in his, he's on his deathbed and he's like, John, did you take care of this, this, and this? And I said, Mr. Davies, it's time to let go, right? And his kids applauded. It was fun. So I said, I'll see you later. And I hugged him, okay, and left. So then his family called me and they said, can you do the eulogy? Come on, really? <laughs> mm. So I write the eulogy and I go to the funeral and the guy before me is a really good preacher and he says, you know, this is a celebration. He's in a better place. This is true, right? So I go up there and I said, I agree with that. I want to add this. When Jesus Christ was notified that one of his closest friends died, what did Jesus do? What? Why? Why would he weep? Why? He knows where he is. Why would he weep? Because, because he's the great teacher. And he taught us what to do. When we read Psalms, do we, do we, does David, a man of God, does he talk about anger and frustration and sadness and loss? Was Jesus, did Jesus ever feel lonely? Do you ever feel lonely? Jesus felt lonely. Or just angry, right? Or just sad, right? So I gave that eulogy and I cried my eyes out, okay? And looking at the family in the front row, they cried with me. It was the best speech I ever gave. I'm not going to cry today, I don't care, but, but it was the best speech I ever gave. Now, just stay with me on this. Two years earlier, when I was at the other funeral for the, for the wife, this is like this very traditional old Southern Baptist family, old Southern Baptist looking people, and there's one granddaughter. No, I'm just telling you, just give me a visual. This is a, just have that visual in your mind. There's a one granddaughter, and she's probably in her mid-20s or whatever, and she's clearly a lesbian. I'm just, again, like this, I'm just, just picture that in your mind, okay? And I just thought to myself, I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, you know, she doesn't really fit in or whatever. I mean, just in the, not in the whatever. So then at Mr. Davies' funeral, I see her again, okay? So I get done with the funeral and I walk in the back, whatever. That young lady walked up to me and she hugged me like that, intensely, belly to belly, cheek to cheek. And she's crying and I'm crying, right? What's up with that? Because our hearts are connected. And I gave her a gift of allowing her to weep for her grandfather, and she gave me a gift of allowing me to weep for my friend. 
that's weird, right? Someone took a picture of that, like, what's going on with Crossman? <laughs> but it's beautiful, right? And when I was at the suicide walk the other day, I had a man walk up to me and crying. He said my name, I didn't recognize him, and he hugged me, and he hugged me tighter and longer than anyone's ever hugged me in my life. He was bawling his eyes out. He walked away, and I said to my friend, I said, who was that? He goes, John, his son com tried to commit suicide. He flatlined six times, and he lived, but he's all messed up. So I've learned about hugs and intimacy and the gift that is. And so for me to understand sadness has made me a better father, made me a better husband, made me a better leader. And sometimes what we got to do in some situations is just sit and cry with people. I was the guy that if you said, how are you doing? I'd say, good, bless. Now people ask me how I'm doing. I say, man, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. My wife is very ill and my mom's very ill. I sold my company last year so I could spend more time with them. Okay? And so people ask me, how's it going? And I'm like, man, it sucks. I'm lonely. I have a lot of loneliness, right? I'm by myself, right? I, don't, I go to some events by myself. Sometimes I go take one of my daughters to me, but that's just a thing. Now, I have wonderful things in my life, too, but it's that duality, and I try to share that. Okay? Check it out. I'm going to wrap up. How much time do I have? I'm done? Five minutes. Oh, my gosh, I'll go really fast. I just want to talk about being coachable, and I kind of said this earlier, but I think that always having a spirit of wanting to learn. Coach K, the famous basketball coach, uh, talks about when he's recruiting athletes, he'll say things like, um, you should say thank you more often. And the athlete might look at him and say, oh, well, thank you, Coach K. I, I, I thank you, and I will work on that. Thank you so much. Or he, the athlete might look at him and say, right? why does Coach K do that? He wants to see if they're coachable. I ask young people all the time, they'll, um, if they hand me their resume, I'll ask it to email it to me. If they email it to me, I'll ask them to mail me a copy. Why do I do that? I just want to see if they follow directions. I want to see if they're coachable. I want to see if they listen and they know. But we all can be coachable. Great moment. S somebody posted, I don't do this too often, but somebody posted on Facebook about, is atheism a religion? And one of the things I get really irritated because I'm a history guy is when people say that uh, religion causes wars. Uh, or wars, cause, whatever that is. But you know, 77% of all deaths in all humanity are wars are non-religion related. It's religions don't cause wars unless you kill atheism and then they do. Anyway, so I said something in that effect and so a woman rebuked me and the, her phrasing, I was like, huh, she's right. So I responded back and I said, I, thank you. I said, I'm sorry, you, you, you are correct. The way you worded that is more appropriate than how I did and I apologize. The woman responded to me and she said, oh my gosh, somebody acknowledged a fault on the internet, like on Facebook, like it's unbelievable, you know. And so I, but I, and I, so I like that. I, I, I want to be coachable. I want to get corrected, right? It's interesting. So I am a, like a conservative Republican. Like, man, I'm as hard as you can possibly think I'm a conservative Republican. But bigger than that, I love Jesus. And so I work with people from all different parties. And I like putting pictures of me with different people on Facebook and LinkedIn because I like to show that story. So I met Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama is ridiculous. She is tall, she's a beautiful, and she's, if she walked in right now, we would just all freak out. I mean, she's like grace. So I put a picture of she and I together on social media and I just said, hey, we don't agree a lot of political issues, but we believe in kindness. People lost their freaking mind, both sides of the aisle. It's sort of funny to me, people just go crazy. It's ridiculous. But to me, it's like, that's what I want. I'm trying to build a bridge. I'm trying to get the conversation going, right? And so part of this is having a humble spirit of being coachable, okay? The last thing is, is um, uh, connections. And you know, the old expression in business is not what you know, it's who you know. And that's actually dumb it, because it's actually who knows you, right? Like, you know, I, kn I know who Matthew McConaughey is. He doesn't know who I am, right? I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, so I think that making a concerted effort to connect with people. And in making connections, you start with commonality, right? So commonality of like uh, your faith or your geography, or your alma mater, or whatever. But being intentional about the connectivity we have is really, really important, OK? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I have 30,000 connections on LinkedIn, so I'm tapped out. They won't have any more, so you can follow me. Uh, I'm embarrassed about that, but it kind of, I'll delete some people. I don't know. But, but, um, <laughs> but you can follow me on LinkedIn. You can follow me on Facebook. You can connect me on Twitter, Instagram. You're welcome to do all that. And you know, to me, I always tell people like connecting, like making the connect and make the attention, uh, being encouraging in everywhere we can is an important thing in life. So I think I'm done. I think that was a little bit rushed. Oh, there's my, you can connect to me if you want to.
Any questions? Anything we have talking about? Was that helpful? You know, the topic was leading a balanced life, and the reason why I, what, what I was really trying to get into is that it, it's these hard topics and choices are one of the best things you ever do. So people say, how do I live a balanced life, and how do I make the most impact? Like, well, look, uh, see your doctor every year and get a physical, and I mean that. Yeah, every year get a physical. You know why? You have a baseline, right? And you baseline, 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 and then if you have a health issue, we can, they can compare it every year. Every year get a physical, right? Like, you want to have um, e eating right, exercise, all good, moderate exercise. You know that if you played um, pro football, 100% chance you're going to get injured in a season. 100% chance. You might miss one play on one practice, but you will get injured if you play pro football. Would you go play pro for a pro football team that had no medical staff? It's ridiculous, right? So here's the dealio. What's the percentage chance all of us in this room have had something traumatic in our past that we probably haven't dealt with yet? Pretty high. What's the likelihood we're going to have something traumatic happen to us in the future? All right, so we need to think through when something traumatic happens, what are the resources, the errors in a quiver we need to deal with that? And then when someone around us has something tragic, how can we help them? And we don't have to cure everything. We can, we can have other uh, weapons in there to deal with it, right? So like if you know somebody that gets arrested and they're in prison, like you call me, I, I like prison ministry, right? Somebody's in a hospital, what do we do? You get know somebody's in the hospital, right? Somebody's having a mental health issue or an addiction issue or any number of those topics. Let's get the right people around us now so that when we have to deal with something like that, we have the resources we can tap into. Okay? Good, good, good. I used to think that my life was about um, finding out where I was sinning and repenting. I still think that's true. But deeper than that for me now is finding where I need Christ to heal me. Where is my leprosy? That's, that's really it, because my sins are usually from a wound. And then learning how to talk about that. Oh, it's hard. Anything, any other questions or anything? I need to wrap up. You're making me go. You can just, just let anybody who wants it. Don't raffle it, because if you want to. No, because you get, somebody gets it, and they, then they put it on eBay or something. No, 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 no. No. No, just let, let somebody have If they want it, they can have it. It's your show, not my show. My gosh. Get her up. Get her up. I'll stay and answer some questions if you need. Can I sit right here? Yeah. I'll sit right here.